this morning. We're just going to we're going to give a very high overview of countryside stewardship and the different elements of it. We'll give an introduction to an improvement in 2019. Uh, we're going to talk about the timelines for requesting application packs and making an application. Uh, we'll talk about submitting a mixed application or woodland only application. Um, we'll touch on how to score your application and then we'll talk about agreement management. Um, so if you're not familiar with countryside stewardship, um, it, it sort of has three sort of um, three elements, I guess, uh, that's perhaps long term, but three three parts to it. The higher tier, which is what we'll be talking about today, uh, which is a, which is um, the grant offer for the more complicated options, um, where um, advisor input might be required from the Forestry Commission. Um, there's the mid tier, uh, which has the simpler options for agri-environment, um, and then there are a range of capital grants um, uh, that sort of uh, available separately. There are also capital items available in the higher tier. So on the next slide, just to sort of try and translate that into what it means in, in perhaps slightly more real terms. So the higher tier, what we're talking about today is the Woodland Improvement Offer. That's a multi-year offer for under the, the option of WD2. And there's also capital items available under there for things like woodland roads and fencing. There's no uh, woodland elements in the mid-tier. That's all agro-environment stuff. Um, and then there are a number of different types of capital grants available under uh, countryside stewardship. Uh, we won't talk about those today, but just so you're aware of them, um, if you're new to countryside stewardship, there's uh, support for dealing with tree health issues. Um, there's a grant to, prepare, uh, to help with the preparation of woodland management plans. Uh, and there's also support for woodland creation, both in terms of the initial capital cost to plant the trees and then um, maintenance payments as well um, after that. So that's a very sort of high level, quick run through of the structure of countryside stewardship. So we're really talking today only about higher tier, uh, which provides support for, um, provides support for <coughs> Uh, grant uh, activity on environmentally sensitive sites and and woodlands, and so as I say, that's uh, that's why um, advisor input is required just to agree the works um, with the, the land manager or their agent. Um, I've sort of touched on a few of these points before, but yes, there's multi-year management options um, for woodland. That's the WD2 option. That's the five-year uh, annual payment. And then there are capital items as well to support um, specific investments to help the management of the woodland. Um, there are three types of high tier applications. So you can have a woodland only application, agri environment only, or a mixed. So they're fairly self explanatory, the mixed being where you've got woodland, you're applying for grants on both the woodland and the uh, agri environment part of the um, estate or holding. Um, We'll talk a little bit about the scoring later, but it, it's also targeted, and the aim the aim is really to help enhance um, have, um, enhance woodland for priority habitats, priority species, uh, restore uh, plantations on ancient woodland sites, uh, and also um, support sort of management activity or restructuring of woodlands to improve water quality in acid sensitive catchments. So that that's sort of the objectives of the high tier offer. Uh, and as I say, your application can be made up of uh, that multi-year woodland improvement option, uh, the WET2, uh, on its own, or it can be applied for in conjunction with capital items. There are also some capital items that you can apply for in isolation without FY2 as well, and that's uh, set out in the manual. Um, Okay, so um, looking a bit more specifically at woodland improvement, um, so for WD2, uh, this is a multi-year option for woodland. Um, agreements with WD2 will run for five years, uh, and as Alex touched on, that the priorities here are that the works will improve biodiversity and improving water quality in acid-sensitive water catchments. So the payment rate is £100 per hectare. And all the works within WD2 must be informed by a woodland management plan. 
Similarly, for capital items, there may, must be a rationale as to why the items are needed within, contained within the Woodland Management Plan, which we'll touch on a bit more in a moment. So just to outline the activities under WD2, um, these are to reduce the percentage of conifer species within five years, to create and or manage open space, create and or manage access rides, and manage, excuse me, manage rides through a zone cutting regime, maintain deadwood habitat in line with UKFS, control grey squirrels, manage success, successional scrub, managing coppice, uh, protect veteran trees from competing tree growth, um, also thinning, selective felling and regeneration felling, and looking at controlling invasive species or competing species, as well as control deer and, uh, and to produce a deer management plan. So where it's complementary and not used to fund the same work, multi-year and capital woodland improvement options can be applied for on the same land. So alongside WD2, there are a range of capital items. There is two years to do the work and a further three months to claim for capital items. Um, some of these are available as standalone capital items, so you can have an agreement just with those, and others can only be applied for in conjunction with WD2. Um, so as you can see on the, the slide here, this is taken from the higher tier uh, manual. It's a table that um, outlines all the capital items, uh, which can be standalone and uh, which must be used in conjunction with WD2. Um, so looking at actual cost items, uh, so some capital item payments are based on actual costs. And these are paid at percentage rates. Um, so the two actual cost items available to woodland ap um, applications are FY2, which is infrastructure, which is paid at 40% of the claim value, and SB2, which is scrub control for difficult sites, paid at 80% of the claim value. So with these, um, when you submit your claim, the, the claim will be for the, the full amount of the, um, of the capital item um, as per the agreement but what will be paid will be 40% for the infrastructure and 80% for the um, scrub control. And so for these actual cost items, uh, three quotes are required, uh, and these must be submitted with your application um, by, the, by the final stage of the application at the end of August. Um, and just to add a note on uh, value-added tax, uh, if the agreements include actual cost of capital items for the FY2 or the SB2, these will be paid net to VAT. Non-VAT registered agreement holders may be able to reclaim VAT subject to the vision of evidence on non-VAT registration. <coughs> okay, so just looking at um, eligibility to apply. So, to apply for higher tier, the land must be with, uh, sorry, be within an agricultural area or a woodland. So, an agricultural area is defined as any area taken up by arable land, permanent grassland, and permanent pasture or permanent crops. Uh, and for a woodland, this is defined as an area of being a minimum of 0.5 hectares, uh, a minimum of average width of 20 meter under stands of trees. Um, with the potential to achieve a height of 5 metres and a crown cover of more than 20% of open ground. And both those definitions are covered within the higher tier manual. Um, so the land to, to be eligible, a parcel cannot be subject to an existing multi-year agreement, such as environmental stewardship. Um, again, more information can be found uh, within the higher tier manual under section 3. Um, containing information on eligible land management control, DPS, and land receiving other funding and other eligibility criteria. A um, couple of other points to, to consider uh, regarding woodland uh, higher tier applications. Um, there is a requirement to have an approved woodland management plan, which I touched on earlier. Um, and the land parcels entered into the application must be declared as woodland. So they might ha must have the, the Woodland Land Use Code, which is WO12. So to, to give you a bit more information on the Woodland Management Plan criteria, 
Um, the weather management plan is a mandatory requirement for the higher tier applications. Um, so as we as we touched on earlier, this will um, set out the, the the rationale for the the um, items being applied for within your application. Um, so at the point of the application, 3rd of May, so this is the deadline for submitting applications, your plan must either be fully approved or approved in principle. And what approved in principle means is that the plan is deemed approved, but it's still waiting for any felling outlined in the plan to be approved. Um, so it's just worth noting, if you haven't sent us your plan by now, uh, it's unlikely that you'll have one approved or improved in, in principle in time to, to come to higher tier this year. Um, and just to clarify, so the plan must be fully approved with all felling permissions in place where it's required um, by the 31st of August 2019. Okay. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so I'm just going to run through uh, the key dates for the higher tier um, application processing um, um, for this year. Um, so the application window has now opened. It opened on the 18th of February, and you can now request an application pack. So you need to request those packs from uh, RPA and their, um, their team. Um, the deadline to request an application pack is the 31st of March. And then the deadline to submit your initial application is the 3rd of May. So looking back at previous years, or at least last year, the, the application window has opened a little later. Um, and that's really to accommodate a number of changes that the RPA have made to their systems to try and improve the uh, efficiency for them in terms of producing packs. Um, some, uh, we have heard that some agents have requested packs and, and the issuing of those packs has, uh, has, has been slightly delayed. That's, that's uh, now been addressed and the RPA are starting to issue packs. And um, just to explain that, that was by design, it was just to ensure that uh, sort of RPA were, were very carefully controlling the rollout of those processes to make sure packs are issued correctly. Um, but as I say, packs are now being issued. Um, once all the applications of initial applications have come in, um, that we, we review their scores against uh, the available budget uh, to, to determine which is, which will proceed to the next stage, and we aim to do um, to notify applicants of that decision um, uh, in early June. Um, you are not you may not hear from us if your application has been successful. In that you well you will hear from a woodland officer because they will want to talk to you about your application. Uh, but uh, the RPA uh, will contact everybody who has not been successful at that stage. Um, so successful applications then move into sort of a negotiation stage where a woodland officer will review the application and, and discuss it with, um, with the applicant um, where necessary. That will sort of bring in um, other bodies such as Natural England if the um, application is on SSSI or it has other sort of designated features where um, their input is, is, is needed. Um, and the aim is to wrap those negotiations up by the end of August. And then um, the, that, the sort of final agreement is reflected in a final a sort of application or negotiation schedule that's sent back out to the applicant in mid-September for them to sign um, and get back to us to confirm that they're happy to proceed on that final application uh, at the on the 30th of September, and at that point, any outstanding evidence uh, must be uh, submitted. Um, uh, this year, that that will mainly relate to the the roading and SB2 options that um, Amanda uh, has, has just mentioned. Um, and then after that, the woodland only applications are subject to a final scoring round. So the scores are reviewed in light of the negotiation and, and sort of what the final package of work looks like and what the final areas are. Um, uh, that's done in early October to determine which of those final applications will proceed. And then the RPA uh, proceed and issue those agreements. Um, and the agreements will start on the 1st of January 2020. So that's sort of the timeline. I think if you're familiar with high tier, essentially the sort of the, the, the sort of the back end of the process is very much the same. It's just some changes to the 
to the to the dates at the start here around uh, application window uh, opening and closing have, have changed a little. Um, so what's changed for 2019? Um, so a number of improvements have been made. Um, the high tier manual has been rewritten to try and make it more uh, accessible to applicants and remove some of the perhaps duplication. Um, uh, so, so that's been a change and, and, and worth, uh, if you're not, it's always worth sort of, even if you're familiar with the scheme, reviewing the manual to make sure you're sort of uh, up to speed with the latest positions. Um, a big change has been uh, a big change has been the move to uh, a single point of contact for uh, engagement and um, requesting packs from the RPA. Um, so whereas before you might have dealt with uh, some of the different, if you like, what were, what were sort of terms, countryside stewardship delivery teams, um, all of all of uh, CS related enquiries now go through this single point of contact, and, and these these are the details, and they're also uh, provided in the manual. And the, the, I guess the key thing really is that to request a pack, this is where you need to go, uh, and this is the team that will sort of initially log that request and make sure it's handed on to the people who will then produce the pack. So, so use this single point of contact, please, rather than any existing uh, contact details you might have for uh, CS delivery services. Okay. Um, there's quite a lot of ground to cover, some of it a bit of a recap, but some of it um, just a few tweaks and changes for the coming year. Uh, we'll just pause to just run through some questions. Uh, and a question about whether all the woodland on the holding needs to be entered. Um, no, that, that not for a high tier application, but um, for the we would expect all of the woodland to be covered in the management plan. Okay, I think that's all the questions we've we've got at the moment. There will be an opportunity for more questions as, as we continue through the slides. Okay. Um, so we'll move on. Um, just a couple of points about uh, making mixed applications. Um, so mentioned at the start uh, about these. This is this is where you, you're applying for. Um, for grant support for management of your woodland and your agro-environment land. Um, there are some scheme requirements as well, though, that require you to think about your uh, sites of special scientific interest and your scheduled monuments, irrespective of where they might be on, on the land holding. Um, so essentially, you need to even even if the triple S I is even if you're only interested in applying for woodland. Um, the woodland option or I capital items, you still need to declare, uh, if you like, or, or uh, include the triple SIs and schedule monuments in your application. And that, that applies even if those schedule monuments and triple SIs are not within the woodland area. Um, and there's a scheme requirement that the um, we, can't, we can't offer uh, grant aid if um, if, it, if, if you like, that grant scheme would miss an opportunity to uh, improve the condition of, of those designated features. So they need to be declared, if you like, on, on your application so that they can the, the management of them can be reviewed. Um, and if necessary, uh, you might be asked to include them, include works um, on them, if, even if they're out with the woodland that you might be interested in. Um, so as I say, so in some ways you might consider that a mixed application. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will end up with a mixed agreement, though. It, it's really just a case of, of having that information provided to us, uh, well, to RPA and Natural England up front so that they can just review the management of those features um, and um, determine whether or not they should be included in the agreement. Uh, if they're all under management and there's, there's no opportunities there, then your application would potentially uh, just proceed as a woodland only one, uh, and the triple SI or schedule monument wouldn't be wouldn't be included. Um, okay, um, move on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, sorry, I've sort of talked through a lot a lot of this already. 
But again, I guess it, just just to reiterate, so you understand why we ask for that, is that it's to ensure that um, uh, Natural England uh, are content that the triple SI or scheduled monuments uh, are appropriately managed, so um, there won't be any damage to them or missed opportunity for their management, and that's why they must be included in the application. Um, and if you if you don't declare um, those designated features, or you include options that could damage um, the, them, then your application may be uh, rejected. Just to be aware of that. Okay. Um, the next slide talks about uh, heifers or heifers, the um, historic environment farm, uh, historic environment farm environment record. Um, which are produced when for higher tier um, when you make, request an application pack by um, with input from Historic England and um, where available um, local authority archaeologists. Um, the 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 heifer the heifer uh, has has been subject to a bit of a review by the RPA this year. But for higher tier, where the woodland where woodlands are concerned, it's it's going to be the same as previous years. So when you request an application pack, uh, the RPA will request a HEFA report on to go along with that application pack, and that will be submitted uh, provided to you um, separately to the rest of the application documents. Um, we understand that the report will be uh, essentially the same as it has been in previous years. So you'll be emailed. Uh, covering it message with maps, uh, hints and tips, document and tables. Um, and within these tables, the, 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 the HEFA makes recommendations on which grant items or options could be used to uh, best support the management of those um, uh, features of the historic environment. Um, the HEFA includes recommendations where on scheduled monuments. Um, um, and it will recommend uh, management options for them. Um, but in woodlands, it won't uh, mark those as mandatory. And that's because there is an expectation under the UK forestry standard, which is you know, the, the benchmark for good sustainable forestry, that those scheduled monuments will be kept in good condition and, and looked after. So uh, the HEFA won't have mandatory requirements against scheduled monuments. Uh, despite that, though, uh, you know, when woodland officers review applications, they will be uh, looking at that and, and, and just seeking to see uh, that um, the scheduled monument is already uh, managed under best practice, um, and they will discuss with applicants if they think there could be opportunities to, to support the, the management of those features and the potential to bring them under the agreement. Um, Okay. Um, at times, you might not get a heifer response, um, um, and that would indicate there aren't designated sites in the area, uh, and there are certain counties that have uh, opted out of the heifer process. Uh, and in that case, um, there'll be an automated uh, response from the system that confirms the location of any scheduled monument. So at least you're aware of any designated sites that you should be considering as you develop your application. Okay, um, that's it on the uh, historic environment report. Uh, again, we'll just pause for any questions on mixed applications and, and heifers. Heifers. Um, there's none. I'm hope hopefully that's not bamboozled everybody. Um, but um, okay, if there's no questions, uh, we'll move on to talk about scoring. Um, Okay, um, how to score your application. Um, okay, so higher tier is competitive uh, part of countryside stewardship, so all applications are scored, um, and the area that's within the grant application needs to be in um, the sort of target areas that, um, uh, that, that sort of command the score. Um, and again, it sort of goes back to the objectives of countryside stewardships and the and area, areas that are subject to that receive a score uh, need to be within uh, those allocated for priority to habitats, priority species, pause, restoration, or water work. Um, 
Okay. Um, there are sort of two parts to scoring. Um, um, essentially, you need to select your objective, so uh, which is the objective you're going to score against, and then you need to determine the area of woodland that's within that objective area. And you can only score um, against one objective for your application. Um, there are additional points available for um, situations where more than one ob objective may apply, and we'll touch on those in a moment. Um, and applicants are required to do a self-score and, and need to complete that when they submit their uh, application. And there's part of the application annex. Um, annex 2 relates to woodlands, and that um, requires uh, does some of the scoring, the calculation of the score, but you need to put in the, the right area against the objectives that you have selected. Um, and you need to achieve a minimum uh, of 1,100 points to be uh, to be eligible. So that that self score determines if you if you're eligible, um, and it will be reviewed initially. Uh, re sorry, reviewed um, and updated with a forestry commission score if your application gets to the sort of the final round of scoring. So after all those negotiations I mentioned have taken place and any adjustments have been made to the application, we just review that score. Uh, see if it's changed to, to determine, again, which schemes will go forward. Um, that threshold score may change, uh, subject to available uh, budget compared to the value of the applications that we have. Okay, so how, how to self-score. The um, key thing is really to read the guidance on this, um, and your application pack will include or direct you to uh, some how-to guidance, which will uh, run through this. Um, you, so you need to make sure that the land in your application, as I say, is uh, under one of the CS objectives. Um, and then you can use our online uh, land information search to, to look at that and check that and then see, uh, com, com work out the area of the, of the, of the woodland that, that falls into the different um, objectives and whether they score high or low uh, priority um, points. Um, our land information search has, has, has service has changed um, to, a, to a new format and we'll touch on that briefly. Um, but these slides don't go into too much detail on that, and I, I think perhaps, if I'm honest, we, we will consider whether it's it's worth a separate webinar or, or video just to sort of walk people through how to use our new system uh, to do the scoring. But it's a, essentially, if you're familiar with the old list, it's very very similar in that you've got layers that you put onto the screen, and then you draw out your shapes and measure them to work out um, the eligibility. Um, and it's a bit more slicker than the old system. so. Um, uh, an improvement there for people using it. Um, as I've mentioned, yet yeah, there is, there's a supplementary. You need to score against one objective, but there's a supplementary score uh, if you meet the criteria. The criteria. So if the um, uh, woodland is in a, a woodland bird assemblage area, includes triple S I land, or has multiple objectives. And again, sorry, I've got ahead of myself. Um, tab 2F of Annex 2, uh, which you'll receive in your application pack, uh, is where you put in your score. And the next slide just has a screenshot to show what that looks like. Um, so you've got your ob objectives there, uh, and then they're broken down by different um, uh, different priority uh, priorities in some cases. So you would insert the area of WD2 uh, if you're applying for, or the area of capital grant that you're applying for. Now that sounds a bit um, odd, areas and capital items. Um, so what you need to do if you're applying for capital items is work out what's called the area of influence, um, which is basically if you install a capital item, what, what sort of area of the woodland will benefit from that capital item. So if you're installing a fence around the perimeter of your woodland, then the whole area of your woodland would benefit from that. So that would be the area of influence. Um, if you were installing some infrastructure, some roads, then um, you need to consider the the area of, of uh, the woodland that that roading will um, 
help bring into management. So there's more guidance on that in the manual, but that's basically the principle. So for capital items, just think about, right, what is the area of woodland that that will um, help, help me manage and uh, improve? Um, do be careful, though, because you, you, you can't score areas under WD2 and uh, a capital area of influence. So you, you need to just um, go for, for one if both of them would apply. Um, as I say, your score was this, you, you put in the self score, um, and it will be reviewed by a woodland officer um, at the end of the negotiation process. And uh, 1,100 points will be the minimum for the self. For, self-score and initial application to be eligible and considered. Uh, and then we will, as I say, we will look at the value of all of the initial applications uh, and set a threshold score based on available budget. Uh, the table at the, at the bottom there just shows the supplementary scores, uh, as I mentioned, wood, uh, woodland bird assemblages, triple SI, multiple objectives, uh, and they can um, award additional points to your uh, application. Um, so the next slide, is, is it, I, I'm afraid it is based on our old map browser, but the principle is essentially the same, and it just gives you, um, hopefully I can give you a bit of a flavor for how it works. Um, so in this case, um, uh, sorry, well to start, you need to, you need to score each of your woodland blocks individually. So where you're scoring against biodiversity, you need to determine whether each woodland block uh, has a high or low score. And to do that, you just need to work out whether or not uh, more than 50% of the, 50% or more of that block is in the high or low uh, priority area. So in this uh, example, um, we've got shapes one and two. Uh, which are in the high priority area. Uh, uh, if, uh, so more than 50% of that overall area for that block. So if you take the whole block, sorry, as shape one, two, and three, shapes one and two are within um, the high priority area, more than 50%. So that entire, the entire area of that woodland block would, would have uh, points for the high priority biodiversity score. On the next slide, um, sort of the, the opposite to that, so again, if you consider that the, these two red shapes are the woodland block, or they might be the ex full extent of your application, in this case, uh, shape two, the larger one, is more than 50%, and it's outside that high priority area, and, and therefore it would, um, it would not score the high priority points. Um, if it were to... If you have more than 50% in the low priority area, um, then the, low, the, the points for low priority would apply. Um, where are my notes? So, but if you need to make sure that certain criteria are met to, um, to secure those low priority points. And they are, if I can find them, I can't find them. They are, um, uh, as, lo as long as that area is still within a CS priority area for priority species, a woodland bird assemblage, um, or for conifer woodland, there is an intention, well, sorry, and for if it's conifer woodland, there's an intention to convert that woodland uh, towards broadleaf. Um, so there are those additional criteria that apply if you want to secure the low priority score. Um, the next slide, um, just just to give you a play, just it, just to show how the same thing looks in the new um, land information search. It's essentially the same information. Uh, this first picture just shows that you you pick your you pick your layers, and it has the same information in there, and it will display that. And then on the next slide, um, you can see. Uh, that the, the drawing tool has been selected to draw out those sh the same shapes that I've drawn uh, in the previous example. So you can use that same sort of idea to, to sort of sketch out your application and see how it falls across the different objective areas. Um, and then there is, 
there isn't a slide showing this, but there is a, then a measurement tool within um, uh, this, this map browser that allows you to measure the area. So you can then work out um, how the area, how the area, how much area is in the different priority um, zones uh, to determine your score. As I say, the key thing for it really is to just look at each block individually, work out at the block block by block. Um, whether it's high priority or low priority score applies, and then you can add those together, put them into the um, into the Annex 2F, and it will calculate the score. Um, the next slide, just just a summary here to show you um, an example of the guidance that is within the how-to guide uh, that explains in a bit more detail, perhaps a bit more clearly than I've <laughs> done there. Um, and you can, uh, you can pick over it in your own time how the scoring works. Um, but yeah, I think the key thing is look at each block individually and work out if it's uh, uh, work out the score for that, and then sum, sum them all up and put them into the annex. Um, yeah. So the next slide, yeah, it was just a recap on the on the mapping. Um, and we'll, as I say, we'll, I don't know if there's going to be any questions coming up, but we'll, we'll consider whether that's worth us running another webinar or a video just to walk through step by step how to score something using the new browser, um, just to help you with that. But I think when you get into it, it, it seems a bit daunting, but it's it's uh, once you get into it and use the browser, it's uh, easier than it seems. Okay, so we've had a few questions come um, in. Um, while I was talking about scoring there. Um, what I'm going to do is just quickly run through uh, a couple of points on web sender application and agreement management. Uh, and then what we'll do at the end is go back and look at those questions and, and any more that, that you have before we wrap up. Um, okay, so in terms of where to send your application, uh, as we touched on earlier, there's now a single port point of contact within the Royal Payments Agency. Uh, so rather than having to deal with different uh, operational offices, uh, there's one telephone number, email address, and postal address to request an application pack, and also this is the same as where you will send your application pack back to. Uh, so we've got the details up on the screen there, uh, but these can be found in Annex 9 of the new higher tier manual, uh, which is obviously on the, the .gov pages. Um, okay, so just moving on to evidence requirements. Um, so uh, a key improvement that's been looked at this year uh, surrounding evidence is the reduction of requirements that you need to routinely submit with your application or, or with your claim. Um, so this year, you'll only be required to send um, certain specified evidence to the Royal Payments Agency. Um, so if you have a look um, at the Grant Finder tool, so that the item guides on the .gov website and also within the higher tier manual, it will set out what evidence needs to be submitted uh, with your application, what needs to be submitted with your claim, and what evidence you'll be required to keep um, and submit if requested. So if you're familiar with the scheme, certain evidence that you would have routinely submitted with your application uh, may now no longer need to be submitted uh, with, the, with the application, but you will still need to retain that evidence and hold on to it until it's requested. So the best thing to do would be to, to have a look at the manual uh, and the grant finder tool online, and it will see, you'll be able to see under each, uh, each item, so under WD2 and under the capital items, um, exactly what records are required and, and when they need to be submitted. Um, You'll still need to submit supporting documents with your applications as, as standard, so the option maps and, and supporting annexes. Uh, but as I say, for, for further information on other things, um, do, do have a look at the, the, the item guide, um, which sets it out quite clearly on, on the .gov website. OK, and finally, just uh, to point on agreement management before we, um, we take any questions. Um, so the um, higher tier <coughs> applications, 2019 applications, uh, these agreements will commence on the 1st of January 2020. Um, and as standard, no agreements on the, no, sorry, no amendments on the agreements are permitted um, unless the RPA has expressly agreed the amendment. 
uh, and these will only be under exceptional circumstances. So you, just a point, you, you must not include any work in your application which has already been undertaken um, or any financial commitment made before the 1st of January or the agreement may be terminated. Um, just to go back onto uh, amendments to options or items within the agreement, so um, as I've touched on, these are not permitted. Um, however, should an exceptional situation arrive uh, where you need to change the choice or location of a multi-year option, uh, the RPA will consider requests to amend the agreement, um, but just to stress, this only applies in exceptional circumstances, um, and the RPA must agree to the request before you make any changes to an option location or, or management. Uh, so in terms of claims, uh, multi-annual claims must be submitted by midnight on the 15th of May. Um, and as we've said, uh, capital claims must be submitted within three months following the two-year period of the capital work, so one or, one or two years. Um, and claims should be submitted online uh, by rural payment. Um, so capital claims can be submitted any time during the period of capital works, uh, and as they must be submitted in three months after this period at the latest. Um, part claims for capital items can be made. Uh, the items where this is available is, is specified in the higher tier manual. Uh, you must comply with the mandatory elements set out in the higher tier, tier manual um, around claims. Um, just to touch on advanced payments for WT2, uh, payments of 75% made within the remaining balance will be paid separately. Um, if you refer to the optional item guides on dove.uk, um, you can see what information is required uh, when submitting your claim. Uh, and Chapter 6 of the High Tier Manual um, sets out more information on this. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Yeah, I think key key point. Don't don't start work until you've got your agreement and that that first of January start date has passed. And and do do sort of take note of the dates to submit your claims, be it your your annual claim um, in in mid May or uh, the timeframes for capital works, because anything submitted after those those dates um, uh, would be wouldn't be paid or you may be subject to a penalty. So so just just be uh, aware of those dates once you've got your agreement in place. Um, okay, um, before we do some final questions, one point, uh, one change I, I, I should have mentioned at the, at the start is that this year um, the RPA's approach to producing map packs has changed and it's all going to be generated through the system, which is um, which should be an improvement. Um, and it will pre populate the pack with, um, with the land parcel information. Um, that change does mean that all applicants will get an Annex 1 and an Annex 2 and those annexes will be populated with all the land parcels on the land holding. So just to be aware of, of, of that, so you'll get that pre-populated annex, if you, or annexes. If you're only interested in woodland, then you don't need to do anything with your annex one, um, unless you have triple SIs or scheduled monuments that you need to, to include in the application, as we mentioned. But otherwise, within the Annex 2, if you're applying for woodland only, you just need to look down that list of parcels and just uh, select those parcels that you're interested in. Um, so, so just be aware that, yeah, you, you'll get all of the land parcels on that pre-populated Annex, uh, and you just need to pick out the ones that you want to uh, include or apply for, uh, for work on. Okay, um, we'll try and, before we wrap up, we'll just go to some, some questions. Um, um, uh, the request for application packs have to be made only by named persons on the RPA permission list. Uh, um, yep, so that's right. So to request a pack, um, you do have to be an authorised person on the RPA. Um, so if, if you're not if you're not registered a, as a, an authorised person, uh, unfortunately the, the the RPA won't be able to to send the pack out to you and you'll need to first get the right permission levels before requesting the pack. Yeah, so, so to request the pack you need the minimum uh, the minimum uh, permission level under countryside stewardship which is, I think is you. So as long as you're, uh, if you're an agent working for a client, as long as your client's giving you that view permission then you can request the pack. 
Um, is the Woodland Bird Assembly Slayer now available on list? Uh, that, that throws doubt in my mind. I, I hope so. I'm going to have to go away and check that. Um, I thought it should be there uh, as it's part of the uh, part of the scoring and, and the, the list system should support that. Uh, it sounds like it isn't there or hasn't been, so we'll take that away and, and, and confirm that. Um, uh, is there a supplementary score for members of facilitation groups where Woodland Management meets objectives of the uh, facilitation group? There, there isn't the, the, the supplementary scores are, are, are set by those criteria that I went through around the triple SI, um, multiple objectives. I think that, that's multiple objectives in terms of the, the, the objective, uh, CS objectives, if that makes sense. Um, uh, what was the other one? Based on those criteria. Um, first example, and then just on our, a question about our first example on scoring, uh, where we had over 50% being in the high priority area, the rest in the low priority area. Um, was that right? Because uh, it seems that the low priority area must meet the other criteria I mentioned. So. So I think it's simpler than that, and as long as 50% of that woodland block is in the high priority area, that whole block gets a high priority point. Um, so there's no need to sort of do that, that sort of second level assessment on, on whether the other criteria are there for the low priority. Um, it's just that, that check just kicks in if there's more than 50% of that woodland block is in the low priority area. Okay. Okay, so that's all the questions that's come in so far. Um, got a couple of minutes left in the time, so if there's any more questions that um, anybody would like to ask, please do so. Um, obviously, we'll get the, the, the clarification um, uh, on the question um, around the woodland bird assemblages on, on the new list, and we'll make sure that that's circulated um, with along with the... Um, the slides and the, and the webinar, uh, and we can send out recording um, in next week in, in an e-alert. Yeah, so we'll send a link to a recording. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I hope, I hope that's been helpful, just sort of an overview of the high tier offer for this year, how it fits with CS and some of the key things. I think the key thing is, is just to, even, even if you're familiar with the scheme, just have a look through the manual uh, and, and the item guides. Um, as, I said, as Amanda said, the evidence requirements have, have changed. Remember, it's that single point of contact now to request your application pass, uh, and just be aware of the, the dates uh, that have changed at the front end of the process to, to make an application uh, to request your pack. Um, okay, I think we'll uh, we'll sort of switch the audio off now, but we'll, we'll just keep the webinar open for a few more minutes any last questions come through, but thanks very much for your time and um, I hope that's been a helpful sort of introduction to the, the offer.